Hey guys, welcome to iDev Journey episode 7.5. I couldn't make it episode 8, but you know, this is technically the second half of what I was going to put into the initial one. It was just too long, like I said before. So let's go ahead and get into it. I think we're starting off on section 22. I could be wrong, but in this video, we go over a an exercise as well as the final quiz that ends off section two that I did not do too well on. Enjoy. Lecture 22 is arrays and not not like arrays but a r r a y s arrays. <laughs> a good example of this is salary. So you don't want to do you know you don't want to create a bunch of variables that are you know employee salary one or employee one salary you know $45,000 employee two salary equals $23,000 var employee three salary did I already say three I don't know equals uh, $70,000 you don't want to do that what you want to do is basically you do var employee salaries equals and then inside brackets you list you do 45,000 comma 72,000 comma and so on and in order to add to that array what you do is you use the append function. You can remove something using the remove function. Uh, I'll show you some examples on the screen. And if you don't have anything in the array, but you know you're going to have something, you, you know you need that array. So maybe for example, say for example you have you want an email list and you want to put it all in an array. Unless you want to put your own email in there first, you won't have any emails to put in there. So you have an empty array. You need to declare that array with make sure there's parentheses after your brackets. Uh, another example on the screen. And then every time you add an email, you do the dot append or you set up a function where you do email list dot append. And whenever someone enters their email into the address box and hit submit, it appends their email into your array. And another thing to know about arrays is in between the brackets, you know how I said what you want to do in between the brackets, 45,000 comma, 23,000 comma. And whenever you want to want to call one of those numbers, for 23,000, you would call inside array, inside the array, you'd call one because arrays start at zero. Like just whenever you think of programming and counting at the same time, count from zero, start at zero because that, that's how the array counts and, and some other things. It's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the, the eighth one in the array will really be seven if you see what I'm saying. So. And then after arrays in lecture 23, we go over loops, which loops are very important. We didn't go over all the loops and I actually learned a few new loops. I, you know, the main loops that I would use is for loop, while loop. Uh, but here we are kind of shown the uh, repeat while loop, which I never really did that. For something like this, I'll do a for loop. But, but what he did was after he showed us the repeat while loop, he showed us a better way to do it and then another better way to do it. So. We went from about three lines of code or four lines of code to two lines of code to even smaller two lines of code or something like that. In this four in loop, basically what, what you wanna what you wanna realize about this loop, and I understand there's a lot of context missing. It's gonna be a little hard taking this out of context, but I can't just teach you the whole entire course. It's kind of plagiarism. But I can talk about it a bit and give you my interpretation of certain things. So the four salary in salaries loop I'll show it on the screen. Basically for each salary in salaries, it grabs each item out of the array one at a time, puts it in salary and runs the loop. Now this was his example. I believe he forgot, I believe he forgot to add in the salary plus salary times point one zero. So basically what we were trying to do with this loop is to add 10% raise to all employees. And just imagine if you were to not use an array, then you'd have to go to each and every single employee and then give them a raise one by one after you declared each employee one by one. But instead we put all of them to array and now we can do a, a loop into that array, which only takes up two lines instead of who knows how many? You imagine if you had 100 plus employees and you'd have to do 100 plus lines. Instead, you could just do two lines. So the main goal with this was to give everyone a 10% raise and he forgot to put it in here. Now let's go on to lecture four dictionaries. Now this one was definitely more difficult. I wasn't really too familiar with it, but 
in all honesty, I know I said this before, but the way he explained it, you know, stuck in my head a little bit better. I feel like a lot of other teachers, when they try to teach you something, they kind of forgot how it was to be a beginner trying to learn something. But the way that he teaches it, he communicates to beginners a lot better than, say, my college professor. No offense to my college professor, because they're great. But Mark is able to communicate on a different level, maybe more, maybe more so like a dumbed down level. Less computer science, more code. I don't know. He starts off this lecture by saying, Google, how do hash tables work in CS? We'll use uh, dictionaries a lot in, with JSON data, uh, APIs and whatnot. So basically where we call data, say we're making a weather app, they have JSON data that you would call out. So people you know, have made an API, you'd call that into your app and then you'd, you'd code it so it displayed onto the screen, just like your iPhone weather app or, or Android weather app. So never forget how to use dictionaries. Or should I say learn how to use dictionaries? I'm gonna make sure I learn how to use dictionaries the right way. And since I don't understand it like as much as I feel like I want to or should, I don't really know much to say on it. I, I see how, you know, if you have a dictionary, say you have airports, uh, ORF is, is Norfolk Airport. You do airports, ORF equals Norfolk. And then if you want to override that, you can say airports, ORF equals nil or equals something else. And then you're able to override what you just did. Now onto another exercise. Lecture 25 is a loops and arrays exercise. And for the record, I haven't done any of these exercises until like the making of this video. So I make these videos, you know, towards the end, you know, obviously I, I've already done all the course and then I go back and do the exercises. You know, you're supposed to do them along the way, but for the sake of the video, I do it after everything. And especially, you know, maybe I may do it prior to the video and maybe do it along the way in the future. In all honesty, I, I understand most of this stuff, or at least most of the stuff prior to maybe this uh, last exercise that we may be going over on oh, polymorphism, I think it is, but we'll get to that. So maybe in the future, I'll be doing the exercises on time, but as of right now, with the stuff that we're learning, I'm completely fine with just doing it when I make the video. So this is section two, lecture 25, exercise Swift three loops and arrays. And I've already gone through this, but unfortunately, what I recorded my screen on decided to not work and I went through the whole thing. So what I'm gonna do is leave this right here and just follow down with me as I go over exactly what I'm doing. I actually decided not to leave my previous commentary in there because it was a little bit all over the place considering the fact that I didn't have the video to go with it. So I wasn't exactly sure how I should go about this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to post a, these quick pictures right here. So you'll see the screenshot of the arrays half and then you'll see the screenshot of the loops half right after it. So like right now you'll see the loops half after you've been seeing the arrays half. And I will be going over it if anybody wants me to. So I, I don't know how many people actually enjoy me going over the exercise. So if you do, seriously, leave a comment below and I will make a whole other video of me going through this exercise again and what my thought process was. I wish my recording software, which is just QuickTime Player on the MacBook, didn't mess up. But, uh, you know, what can you do at this point? So, <sighs> Let's go ahead and get back to the regular video. Lecture 26, optionals. And he stresses optionals are very, very important. So basically he says if you don't want your program to crash, use optionals. They're very important. <laughs> so for example, an optional. Say you do print, and in parentheses you do lottery winnings, exclamation point. The exclamation point means when you get to this code, print out lottery winnings. You want it to print it out 100%, doesn't matter. Print it out. But if you don't have anything assigned to lottery winnings, your application will crash. Instead, what you could do is if lottery winnings does not equal nil, print lottery winnings. But that's still not all that great. I mean, it's, it's more than you need. Of course, if it does equal nil, then it'll just skip over that and you'll never see anything about lottery winnings on that line. It'll just skip right over it. So it doesn't crash, which is good. But instead of doing that, you can do 
if let winnings, you can make it a var or a constant. In this case, we're going to make it a constant, which is let. So if let winnings equals lottery winnings, print winnings. So what that does is if there is a value in lottery winnings, it'll assign it to winnings. And then we print out winnings. If there's not a value inside lottery winnings, then it won't assign, then it won't even worry about printing anything out. So that also works. That is a preferred method over the last one that we just talked about. Another thing you could do, for example, let's say you do var cars car and then a question mark after the bracket. What that does is says it may have a value or it may not. If it does, print it. If not, move on. That's also what init does, which is I-N-I-T. You can use that, which stands for initialize, and I-N-I-T stands for initialize. So you can do that if you don't want to do exclamation point or question mark. I feel like from my understanding of it now, that question mark would work best. I feel like I'm never going to use the exclamation points. So I don't see why you would unless you don't want your program to work without it. But if that was the case, then instead of putting an exclamation point, I would not allow someone to, like say, say you know, your email is required to sign up for this. I wouldn't put an exclamation point so if they don't enter the email, it'll crash. I'd probably put, you know, some type of if else or, or, or something like that where it says if this has no value, reprompt and say, you know, you, you, did, you need to fill out the required areas. And then once they filled out the required areas, they'd keep on going. I don't know why I would use the exclamation point, really. Maybe I'll find out in the future. Maybe I'll just never use it. I don't know, we'll see. And the main point of this is optionals are used to let your program move on and not crash if there's no value in a certain thing. So just like we're talking about, say you're going down, your code's reading, boom, it hits one of those exclamation points where the value, where there's no value, it crashes. Instead, it'll just say, oh, there's nothing there. Skip over it, keep on rolling. So that's what that's for. So very important, remember optionals. Lecture 27, we get into object-oriented programming, which basically object-oriented programming came in, I believe, in like the 70s or 80s after, uh, what was it, functional programming, which is still around, don't get me wrong, but object-oriented is probably what you're going to be doing if you are interested in iOS development and whatnot. So iOS development, you're going to be doing object-oriented programming. Functional programming is more so, I don't know how to explain it. Maybe maybe like if you're writing software for printers or, for, or like that. I don't, I don't know. It's a good question. But a big thing about object-oriented programming are classes. And Mark explained these really well. I never, you know, I kind of, I used classes before, but I didn't understand it like I like I understand it now. So wait, his example was a vehicle class. So class vehicle, and inside that we had, you know, what a vehicle has. So we declared tires that equals four headlights, um, and then we had functions, which one was drive, because these functions are what the vehicle does. So we had function drive, function brake. And you don't even need to put anything inside the curly brackets. You'll just reference them later, which is the thing about uh, classes where you reference them as opposed to something like what we've talked about before, where you would pass by value, which is copying, you know, what you had done over instead of referencing it. And you may not completely understand this. I still, you know, I still have to have to reread and restudy and I don't completely understand all of it, but it'll definitely come over time. Back like a year ago, I never thought I would be this far. But now, imagine next year, I'm gonna be thinking last year, I'm like, oh man, what, what we have to do is just you know stick with it. And as we stick with it, more will come and come and come. As we use it, it'll just be better and better. So that is my advice to you, is just don't quit. That's the main thing. If you do it you know, for even a couple hours a week for a year, you'll be pretty good. I if you're doing it for three days, every single day for three months, you're going to be pretty good at whatever it is you're doing. As long as it's not, you know, trying to become the next LeBron James with basketball and you're doing something that, you know, that you can learn. Lecture 28 is inheritance, which is still kind of foggy to me, although I've gone over this in C++, it's, it, it still is foggy. But I mean, basically, it's, you know, you create a parent class and children classes within those or under those and the children classes inherit things from the parents. Not like you're inheriting money, but like you're inheriting genes. So 
that's the main understanding I have of it. So I'm not I'm not knowledgeable to try to teach you guys about it. So let's move on to lecture 29, which is polymorphism. Mark said that a popular interview question is define polymorphism, and he's and his own words were. I can't really define polymorphism, but I'll show you an example. What he says is that, you know, to, to show an example is a lot easier for him of polymorphism than actually like defining it. So he gave us an example. He gave us an example in code, but what, kind of what I understand from it is, I'm going to nerd out a little bit. Say you're, <laughs> say you're playing uh, World of Warcraft or, or any other game that has like classes and, and sections and stuff. So World of Warcraft is what comes to mind. That has horde and alliance. So let's say horde. So that's H O R D E, horde. Horde. So under that faction, you have races like Tauren, Orc, Undead, Blood Elf. And then under each of those, you have your, uh, your classes, which is mage, uh, whatever, and, and it's specific for each. And that's kind of you know, the basis of polymorphism, from my understanding. So what that's saying is polymorphism, where one object can take on uh, many different forms. Which is basically what that example was trying to explain. Horde can take on any of the other forms. Lecture 30 was a different guy. Uh, I forget his name. It wasn't, it wasn't Mark. He was very easy to understand. Like I had some concerns where some guest speakers may have a thick accent or something like that that I can't really understand or I won't follow. I'll just kind of zone out and get bored. I'd skip through this because I'm not going to remember anything that he's gone over. I'm not going to remember anything until I need it and I use it. So. It was kind of a useless thing. I may refer back to it. I'll let you know if I do, but I don't know. So let's uh, finish this off by doing this final part of section two, which is quiz one. It's, it's five questions. Let's do it. So here is that Swift 3 quiz finishing off section two. So let's go ahead and start it. Yeah, I got zero out of five correct on the first attempt. I don't know. How, I I don't know. I thought I was right on quite a few of them, but I wasn't. Um, so that's it for the quiz, and that's it for this video. If you guys enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Have a good one.